Hello, hello, I'm Katrina Walker and welcome to my studio, where as you can see, it's it's in the negative numbers this morning uh, because of wind chill. So um, I'm kind of bundled up a little bit more than usual. But um, I know some of you are watching from all over the world. It may even be summer where you are. So enjoy that while we're uh, up here shivering in the great white north. But anyhow, I'm super excited to share with you a technique today that is also actually shared with you on um, one of my craftsy classes called decorative seams. So one of the things that in sewing I really want to encourage all of you is to sometimes think outside the box. And and you know how in sports they have you know cross training, right? So you may play one sport, but you do a secondary sport as a way to keep your keep your body balanced. Um, I used I used to fence competitively, so fencing is very asymmetrical. So you always had to make sure you did other kinds of physical activity so that you know your, your right side or left side didn't end up larger than the other. So <laughs> cross training was really important. So I think of sewing as very much kind of a cross training sort of exercise in that quilters and apparel sewists, you know, some people do both and they're they're cross sewists, but um, we, it's really great to be able to borrow things from each other, right? So today's focus is on a technique called seminal piecework. And seminal piecework or patchwork, some people prefer the word patchwork, it doesn't matter to me, I just say piecework. But seminal piecework is, um, it's a type of piecework that has a very distinctive look to it. And it's something that can be adapted to clothing. So let me show you some examples because, you know, talking is one thing, showing is much more effective. So the very first time I incorporated seminal piecework into a garment. Oh, oh, and before I get too excited, um, for Max has to remind me, um, we do have a course, step-by-step -step instructions available for you today. And Max has put the QR code up on the screen for you so you can take grab that with your, your whatever device you like, and that will get you the step-by-step -step ins written instructions for this. So, you know, in case you're frantically writing down, trying to take notes, I've already written it up for you and you can just grab that using that QR code. Okay, so back to the action. So the very first time I incorporated this into a garment was actually for a competition. And I was, this was, well, it was 20 years ago, actually, uh, 20 years ago, I entered the, the Make It With Wool competition, which here in the United States is something that is sponsored by the, the National Sheep Industry and Wool Growers Associations, and it's a nationwide competition, and it's, it's really fun to do, and now I'm a judge and things, but back then I was actually a competitor. So this is the jacket from 20 years ago. And what had happened was, um, this was a very challenging time of life. And so I was actually making this jacket out of scraps. So scraps from work, I worked for Nord Nordstrom Product Group at the time as a raw materials liaison. And so these were all scraps that I had dumpster dived from the design departments around work. And the problem was that I didn't have enough fabric to cut an upper sleeve. So I picked a pattern that had enough seaming. In fact, I even added seams to it in order to, to get all those pieces, because again, scraps, uh, <laughs> all those pieces cut out from my body. But, you know, it doesn't help when I'm tall and I just didn't have enough fabric to cut an upper sleeve. And I was very disappointed because I, I could not afford to go out and buy fabric. Um, so what I did was, I remember now it pays to do your research. You know, when you have a down moment, that's why these days we have Pinterest. And back in the day we had, of course, books. And I have a quite a collection of fashion sewing books. Looks like I'm gonna need to adjust the, let me just quickly adjust the exposure on this so you can see it a little better. It's a little dark. There we go, a little bit better. Oh, I also have lint, but you'll just have to excuse that. Okay, so this was my solution was that I remembered in one of my books, there was a jacket and this jacket had inset diamonds of, in this case, it was a, I believe it was a vintage Givenchy jacket from, I wanna say it was from the forties or fifties. 
like late 40s, you know, the, the whole around the time when Dior was doing the new look kind of thing. Anyhow, so here we so they had in that jacket, they were inset. So that was like reverse applique. And in the reverse applique, there were pieces of girl grain ribbon that were folded to make a diamond pattern. Well, I, I didn't really um, see myself having the ambition to do the figure out the girl grain ribbon. But it occurred to me that, you know, I thought, you know, I bet if I pieced a panel using seminal piecework, if I pieced a panel, put some borders in, that I could get enough fabric to go and cut out that upper sleeve, that I could make this work and I could, you know, center it on my sleeve head and all that. So um, that's what I did. And my inspiration, or partly where I was coming from, you may think, well, how did you ever think of this? Well, I'd already chosen this ribbon. This is an, a Berta style pattern. So this is an older Berta style pattern, you know, back when they had no seam allowances and all of that. Um, and I'd already, they had a ribbon closure, which I thought was really clever. And so I had already chosen to use this ribbon as that closure. And so there was my, my black diamonds on brown. Uh, because this was made out of scraps, of course, I was tying together a lot of different textures and colors of brown fabrics. Sorry, the, the lint's driving me crazy. But anyhow, so that's where I got the idea. Well, what if I did some seminal piecework on the sleeves to go ahead and tie in with the, um, the ribbon that I'd already chosen for the closure on this jacket? And, you know, I have to, so the funny thing is, is it was purely a matter of, purely a matter of necessity. Uh, I really didn't have the fabric without that, doing that technique. But, you know, this is the crazy thing is it, it totally made the jacket. And so this is, these are the kind of details that, you know, I didn't have to do anything crazy to the pattern, really. I basically just made fabric and then cut my sleeve out. And so, um, but it made it possible to cut that sleeve. It, it added that extra, you know, not flashy, but real um, subtle emphasis to the jacket gave it just that much more visual appeal. And it, it actually helped launch my career as a professional because I won the national contest with that jacket. So, you know, um, sometimes out of necessity, beautiful things can happen. So, so anyway, so that started my adventure with seminal piecework. And the funny thing is it keeps popping up in my life. So yet another competition came along and I found myself faced with a fabric I didn't care for. So in this competition, we had to use choose from a certain number of patterns. It was being sponsored by the pattern company. And so we had a choice of patterns and we had a choice of um, fabrics that they would send us. Well, I really liked the sample of fabric, but then when I received it, I didn't care for it. But I realized, you know what? I really like that sample as, you know, in small pieces, I just didn't like it as yardage. I didn't want the whole jacket. So here came seminal piecework again to the rescue. And so instead of, so I dyed a bunch of silk crepe de chine to make the, the main majority of the jacket. This is a pretty long jacket, big old sleeves. We had to model it ourselves and I'm tall, so I made it pretty dramatic. At any rate, this is very, um, this is a little more unusual way to use this. In this case, so again, this is crepe de chine. So in this case, I didn't want to have to line this jacket because it's already, believe it or not, very heavy. And so instead, these the seminal piecework was made, basically these are self-finished tubes. So I cut the backing fabric. Um, I cut the backing fabric, let's see, it was like a quarter of an inch, no, half an inch longer or wider than the, the top strip. So I could wrap it around the sides and then top stitch in the ditch to create these tubes basically that have just been top stitched onto the jacket and you can see this mat let's say is even though this has all been reinforced with um feasible interfacing and that's it if you're going to do this with silk if you're going to do this with silk or another fabric that frays one thing you have to you need to do because seminal piecework you use quarter inch seam allowances i never recommend a quarter inch seam allowance on silk 
uh, it's just too easy to have the fabric fail along your stitching line. The, the, the fabric, the yarns and the fabric will literally pull apart. Um, they'll slip. It's called slipping. But anyhow, so whenever I do seminal piecework with a silk, I use fusible interfacing to reinforce all my fabric before I do my construction. And that helps keep it. But this matless say is just really loosely woven. So it's fraying a little bit, even though it's only been worn a few times in its life. But anyhow, so here was another way to use seminal piecework to add some visual interest, to use the fabric I was required to use in a way that I found attractive, um, even though I didn't like the, the full blown yardage. Um, so again, and I did really well. So, so hooray, um, seminal piecework to the rescue. Okay, a couple more other examples. So here's another kind of crazy one. I really will, am gonna teach you how to do this, but I just thought you might enjoy seeing some examples. So this is a really bold, wild example. So this is a little jacket that I was commissioned to do for not a competition, but for a client. And in this case, see, I need to turn down my exposure here. So in this case, uh, they sent me a picture of a jacket that looked basically approximately like this. So very similar, not exactly, because the original jacket was actually leather. It was like a leather Chanel biker jacket but the fabric they sent me was silk dupioni. So this is a, a really, it's really almost more of a shantung than a dupioni. But anyhow, this is what the lapels looked like on this crazy biker jacket, the Chanel biker jacket. Only of course on the leather, it was actually painted on. And so I thought, well, you know, I, they didn't want me to paint it on. They wanted it, of course, to get out my old friend seminal piecework and piece it instead. <laughs> so it was that was a, a good design challenge to figure out how to reproduce those lapels. But again, um, seminal piecework, as you can see, if I turn this on the side, it's just strip piecing, but you offset it and you put it in on the bias and that creates diamonds, right? So a square turned on its side as a diamond and that's all it is. So it's really, really simple to do. But again, quarter, this is a quarter inch seam. You know, some of these are pretty small on silk. So again, this has all been fused with a fusible interfacing before I even cut out the strips. So really important if you're gonna do this, do this technique on a silk, because remember in garment fabrics, we're not necessarily using cotton broadcloth. We have a much broader range that we tend to use. And so you want to make sure that you, uh, reinforce that. But anyhow, you know, there are all kinds of crazy places. And then finally, the last example, this is for, this is actually the, the dress from the Craftsy class. So again, I said, I also teach this technique as part of the Craftsy class called um, decorative seams. And again, it's just a way to create a little visual interest in the yoke. You don't have to use all the same colors, obviously. You can you can change them up. I did think about, originally I thought about putting a panel down the yoke as, or down the sides um, panel as well, but I, I decided just to keep it simple and just keep it to a yoke top and bottom. Um, don't do this. Don't put a plaid, a plaid, a seminal piecework uh, right in the middle of a zipper. That's a really bad idea. So don't do what I did. But anyhow, hopefully that's some inspiration. Um, something to, to get your creative juices flowing. So now let's look at actually how to do this. And again, remember there's a code up on the screen up in the upper left-hand side there that you can get to, to access the instructions I've written up for you. So you don't have to come up with this all on your own. So we start of course with strips of fabric and I am actually using cotton broadcloth just as my, as my example here. I promptly dropped some of them on the floor. Okay, so for this example and in your instructions, I've gone ahead and just used, oops, it looks like we could use a little pressing here. I thought I'd press this before class, I guess I did not. For this example, I am using a two and a half inch wide 
center my accent, my little diamonds. So this is my center that's two and a half inches wide. And my outside edge is my border is three inches wide. So the difference is you, you always want your side pieces to be larger or wider than your center because you need to have that seam allowance. And when you're working on, you know, if you happen to have say a five eighths inch seam allowance somewhere, or if I was to create a centered seminal piecework panel for the, the main part of the dress, what I would do is, of course, I decide how big I wanted my diamonds going down the middle, but then I would make my border strips extra wide, like quite wide, so that they were at least as wide as the widest part of this panel. And that would allow me to center it on my pattern piece and then simply cut it out after it was all sewn together. So um, if you wanna do this for something like this, where you have you know, maybe a side panel and you want those diamonds to be marching down the center of that side panel, measure the widest part plus the seam allowances. Remember the seam allowances. And that's gonna help you figure out how wide those side pieces need to be in order to bridge that gap. And again, and then so you do your whole big panel and then cut it to fit so that you can just center the pattern on the diamonds. You know, it'll be absolutely perfect. So anywho, back to construction. So again, so you can make this center panel whatever width you want. It can be whatever width you want. It just depends on how you want your diamonds to come out. So obviously, like when I was working on this lapel, of course, I have a whole separate piece with these tiny little, um, tiny little ones. Now to figure out what this distance is, you're going to need to use some geometry. I know you thought you'd never have to use it in real life, but it does come in handy. There are actually calculators <laughs> that will help you figure out what that distance is. So I think these are one inch squares. Um, let's see, where's my, where's the ruler? Let's take a look at this. A little bit of time this morning. No, it's not one inch, not even close. They're half inch squares, not even close. So a half inch square, for example, is measures out to, well, not quite three, well, about three quarters. So I guess it's your, it's your, do your triangular calculations. So, so it's like what, one and a half? Is that the, I think that's something like that is the calculation. Anyway, like I said, there are calculators out there. It's geometry. So my half inch, my half inch square becomes a, basically a three quarter inch uh, diamond. And so you work, you work with your, do your basic math to figure out what size this needs to be. And then of course, you know, you, again, you can add in your borders. So when in doubt, make these side strip, these side pieces, you can make them extra wide because you're going to cut them down. Because you see that I didn't run the seam allowance for this portion right at the tip. There's actually, I have space on either side of it when I was creating the lapel panel. Whereas the center panel, see the, the seam allowance goes right to the tip, right to the edge of each diamond but not this one. This one has more, more air space, so to speak. So you have to plan this out. And again, the way that you, you give yourself that little bit of wiggle room is to make those border pieces extra wide. So again, in this one, I just have um, enough for an extra seam allowance. So it's really not, it's only, it's only that half inch wider than my center. Okay, so the actual sewing is super easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew this, my accent piece, sandwich it in between. So I'm gonna sew it into sew it into my border pieces. So it's basically gonna end up like this, right? Yes. Okay, so let's take this to the machine. And we're just using a basic straight stitch, uh, quarter inch foot, 
um, regular stitch length. I'm not, not doing anything special to my seam. Make sure, of course, that your needle's centered if you're using a quarter inch foot or you'll break your needle. That's never a good thing. Let's make sure I'm all straight here. Piecework is one of those times where you do need to actually <clears throat> Be careful about precision. I said, uh, be careful uh, about precision. Oh, someone's chiming in from Michigan. Hello, Michigan. I understand uh, our Arctic front is headed your way. So <laughs> um, I hope that you uh, are stay warm and comfy. I actually kind of, I am one of those strange people that actually likes winter. So to me, it's a chance to, I don't feel guilty working indoors instead of outdoors. When you, when you live on a, on a little ranch, you, you always, there's so much to do outside to take care of animals and everything that you feel guilty working indoors. So it's nice. So I'm going to, of course, press this to one side and you want to press it toward the darkest side. That's there's lots of jokes about that, going over to the dark side. If you're a nerdy person like myself and like science fiction. Of course, as you sew, so shall you press. And so now I'm ready to go ahead and sew the second border on. And you'll wanna make yourself plenty of these prep strips, plenty of strips. That's your, your basic, your raw materials, so to speak, um, that you can then cut all your piece work with. So even for that dress, if I go dig, dig around in my supplies, I actually still have strips and leftover pieces from doing all that seminal piece work. So actually, I think I have leftover pieces from every project I've ever done, but that's just good. Good practice to give yourself a little extra. You might want to use it for an accessory, you know? You might make an accessory to go with your awesome new outfit, or maybe you're making accessories to begin with. Now, I don't really care if my ends lined up perfectly because, you know, I'm going to be cutting this into strips, so no big deal. All right, one more pressing job. Again, I'm deciding the center is the darkest, so I'm pressing toward the center. With these fabrics, it doesn't matter so much, but if, if I'd used white, then it does matter. Especially if it's not. Now, with my silk, it's all interfaced reinforced with feasible interfacing so in that case that really helps to not have show through of colors okay so there's my prepared strip so let's cut it up so let's go over here to my my little cutting mat here all right so as you'll see in your instructions so this center piece, when I cut it, originally it was two and a half inches wide. So it now should be two inches wide because of the fact that it's been seamed with quarter inch seams. So we're just gonna assume that it is. We're gonna make an act of faith. And um, but you know, regardless, as long as you're consistent about your seams, if I'm off a little bit, as long as I'm off as much, just as much in the same direction, that's what's key. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut this into two and a half inch wide strips going the other direction. So I just wanna make sure I'm straight here. 
Because I mean, I'm an apparel sewist primarily. I mean, I won't say that I've, I mean, I have done, I have made quilts. I have actually, can actually say I've been published in a quilting magazine, but that's not, that's not my norm. You know, I, I started out as an apparel sewist and that's still my preferred method of expression, but that doesn't mean that, again, we can't do a little cross training here. Oops. So, it's gonna... so again, if whatever the width of your center strip, that's the width you're going to cut these into. Get out that rotary cutter. Let's again, make sure you're staying straight here. Quilters really do have the best tools, you know, rotary cutters and all these wonderful rulers and and everything. Why not use them? Even this little cutting mat, you know, it rotates. Like, how awesome is that? Let's double check that I'm staying square here. A little bit on the top there. Now for my sample, three is probably enough, but I'm going to go ahead and cut a few more just because it's always good to have a couple extra. So again, um, what I'm doing is whatever the original width, so not the sewn width, so I'm not cutting this to two inches wide, but whatever the original width of my, the original width of my center, my accent, my diamond, that's what I'm going to be cutting this strip. Oops, no, that's three and a half inches. I was gonna say that doesn't look right. So what happens when you talk and you work at the same time. So once, once you sew these, they'll be square. Right now they're a little off because of the, because they've been sewn with two seam allowances. Okay, because I swerved a little there, but that's okay. We'll cope with it. All right, so there I have my stack, a stack of strips cut. So I'm ready to do some piecing. Yay, or I should say some further piecing. So here's my strips. Now, here's where sometimes people will get, will go astray, so to speak, is that when we sew these, we want to offset them. So the whole point here, no pun intended, is that, you know, when sewn together, of course, that these are going to form an actual strip of these, this diamond motif, right? So they're not intended to be viewed, they're intended to be viewed offset. So basically on the bias. And you just, at each point, you need enough of a seam allowance there to ensure that goes in. Now notice here, so I should point this out. So here I also have a piece of court, half inch wide, so an inch total, but half inch wide uh, flat piping. So when I created these strips, I gave myself, you know, however much of a seam allowance here, I factored in from the point of the diamond however much of a seam allowance there, but then I had to remember and factor in the fa factor in that there would be a half inch covered up by my flat piping. So you have to think about these things. There's a little bit of math involved. Don't let us scare you, but <laughs> um, anyhow, you have to factor some of these things in. But the point I'm trying to make is when we sew these, 
we're sewing them like this. And so we're offsetting. And so it needs to be kind of a stair step. So this is where people can sometimes get a little confused. So for some, it really helps. It really helps to lay it all out, like have it all, like all the stair steps. Let me pull this down a little bit more so you can see this. And so for some, it really helps to just have it all laid out, right? Just marching in order. And then they're just going to seam it accordingly. For some, it's easier to piece as they go. I'm just gonna leave mine laid out for now. So I'm gonna start down here. And so I'm gonna flip this over. So here we go. This is right sides together, flip this over. Now I, I'm not a big pinner, in case you haven't noticed over these various Facebook lives. But I think I do want that on the close up. Hang on. But this is one of those cases. Let's see if I can get this to focus in on this nice and tight. Okay, that's better. Try to ignore my terrible fingernails. Okay, so you can see the seam allowances here. So when I'm pinning. What I want to do is where those seam allowances are is I want them butted right up next to each other. And you can kind of feel, you can feel when those seam allowances are butted together. And so you just want them up real snug, butted up together. And that's where I'm gonna put my pin. So just butt those seam allowances together. Seam allowances, um, basically in this case, are pointed in opposite directions. But again, you just want them to be right up next to each other like that. I'm gonna go ahead and, and sew this seam. And yes, you'll see that how these are all offset. Mine are stair stepping to the right. It doesn't really matter. As long as they're offset, you can flip that strip either way. So let's go ahead and sew this. So just use the same exact, since you cut everything the same width, just make sure you're consistent on your seam allowances. Now, normally I'm really careful about removing pins, but in this case, I will just very carefully creep up. Now this pin is a very, very thin. This is um, clover. This is a clover, extra long, extra fine pin. And so usually if my needle hits it, it won't break. It might, it might bend or break the pin, but not the needle. Um, so I'm not a big fan of sewing over pins, but when it comes to piecework, because it needs to be precise at those joins, I will sometimes do that. Now, also, I like to stop, and if I need to flip that seam allowance up, I will. Okay. I didn't need to go quite to the end because there's no fabric underneath after a certain point, and we don't bother backstitching because this is quilting. Okay, so there's my first stair step. I'm just press this. I'm just going to pick a side now. I can't really go to the dark side because I have to just pick one. Let's just, I'm going to just kind of pull on this just a tiny bit. Make sure that my seams are pressing nice and tight. Oops. I usually end up flipping over the one on the bottom. But okay. So there we go. So first, First step, not the best pressing job I've ever done, but there we go. Okay, so now again, don't do this. No, 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 this. We're gonna offset that, right? That needs to stair step. Again, you know, I do this live in person. This is the one thing the students will sometimes do is they'll end up going back and forth. And you just need to make sure that you're always stair stepping, always 
moving whether it's to the left or the right you have to keep moving the same direction don't don't zigzag <laughs> keep going the same direction so here we go and again i'm just going to butt those seam allowances up next to each other nice and snug now you could theoretically have multiple rows of this you could do strip piecing with multiple multiple rows of this it doesn't have to just be one row i'm just teaching you to do one row but you can of course do uh, multiple rows if you're doing the multiple rows because i know some of you might be already thinking about this stuff when you do multiple rows treat the um this is obviously my border color the white so for doing multiple rows and doing this as strip piecing, when I'm sewing my strips together, sewing the strips together, the border color in between the accent colors, I cut the same exact width as my um, accent strips. So it's only the very outside edges where you add extra width. Anything going on in the middle here is always cut the same exact width. So that might be something that some of you were, were wondering. And if you're wondering that, you're right. You're going to cut those all the same width. It's only the very outside border edges that you would cut extra wide to accommodate any wider seam allowances or what have you. Okay. All right. So just while I was thinking about it, I wanted to point that out. All right. So I'm lined up. Let's sew another strip. So again, I'm just going to slow down, get that needle right there. If you pull the pin too soon, there's a chance that your, your piecing could slip and then not be lined up anymore. Now, I confess, I'm nowhere near as fussy as most, most avid quilters. Uh, I'm not... I believe in high quality, but I'm not a particularly precision oriented person. So, so don't let that surprise you. <laughs> so just want to make sure I'm pressing everything in the same direction as the previous seams. Again, sometimes I give it a little pull, just make sure that it's Okay, and I would just keep going, stair-stepping along, stair-stepping along. Um, what time is it? Oh, let's maybe do one real quick, one more. We'll do four. Okay, so again, make sure you're always moving in the same direction. That's the key. You know, double check that you're oriented correctly. Flip it over. Make sure those intersections, those seams are just butted right up tight next to each other. Put a pin in it. And yes, if I was doing multiples, I would have a pin at every single intersection. The rest of this doesn't matter so much. You know, what I, ouch, what I care about is that my points are always right there touching because of course this is what's gonna look like when it's actually inserted into my project. So see that that extra width of that strip. So the extra width is here and see how it's giving me that seam allowance. It'll make more sense in a moment when I trim it up. OK, so let's go ahead and sew this again. You do have to watch these extra long extra fine pins because they will stick in your fingers better than most also because they're so fine normally i don't even bleed but you know it's a little disconcerting when you look down and there's pins hanging off your hands let's see it's the price i'm willing to pay so 
All right, so there's my four. Let me do a quick press there at the end. Okay. Now we're ready to cut our strips. So now, okay. Having said that, I say that and that is like, well, but okay. If this was truly say the yoke design you were doing and you just need four, of course, remember you're going to sew on an extra border piece on each end. Okay. So you'd put a border piece here and you'd put a border piece, you know, on that end as well. So, and I, I didn't save a piece of fabric, but just remember to cut yourself something to, to finish off each end. You probably already figured that out, but I do need to, to point that out. So cut an extra border strip also, whatever your border color is or border fabric, make sure to cut an extra for each end of your, your piece to section. Okay, so let's take this over to my cutting mat. All right. So here we have our piecing. It's kind of a funny angle, isn't it? Let's see. Okay, it's just gonna be a little bit of a funny angle. But here we have, so again, because I gave myself an extra half inch of width, on, on this piece, it's given me extra seam allowance is how that, that ends up being. We have extra seam allowance here on our edges. So what I mean by extra seam allowance is that, let me grab a, a chalk, chalker here. See if my blue will show up. If not, let's try that one. Okay. So what I mean by that You need to have a minimum, assuming you're using quarter inch seam allowances for construction or whatever you're piecing this into, you know, you need to have a minimum coming off the point. So measuring from the point of those diamonds, you need to make sure that you have at least a quarter of an inch to work with. And oh yeah, this is on the bias. So sometimes you'll need to play with it to get it to actually sit, sit in a straight line. <laughs> So that's the other challenge is trying not to stretch this. So this is on the bias. This is another reason why I often, if I'm doing this for clothing, I often will go ahead and use a fusible interfacing to help control some of that bias tendency to stretch. Okay, so when you're lining this up on a ruler, make sure you're adjusting it so that all your points are actually marching in a row. So if I was using a quarter inch seam allowance, I would then be go, I would go ahead and I would mark it accordingly or just go ahead and cut it. I'm kind of cautious from experience that I will go ahead and mark it first. So if I was doing that quarter inch seam allowance, I'd go ahead and mark it and then cut it on that line. But because I have a little bit extra, I actually could have up to a half inch seam allowance because I gave myself a little extra width on my border. If I just line this up. When I say I have a half inch seam allowance, it's half an inch from the point of that diamond up to the gap. That's how I know, that's, that's what I'm measuring is basically how much space do I have, you know, vertical space do I have between the point of the diamond and the gap between my, my little triangles here? And so actually I can cut up to, I have to stand up to do this. So I can have up to a half inch seam allowance on this strip I've created. 
So minimum of quarter inch, but because I added, I cut, cut this strip half inch wider, I actually have up to half an inch instead of a quarter. So, um, so again, if you're doing this for clothing or something where you're not using quarter inch seam allowance, that's why you cut those border strips extra wide because they give you that wiggle room. So I just can't emphasize that enough. That's, that's really important. You're doing your strategic planning for your project. It's very important to plan ahead and it's best to plan for extra. You can always cut it down, but you can't grow it out, remember. That's super important. Now, of course, normally I'd also be doing this on a larger cutting surface, but we can only fit so much on camera here. So, anywho, so there is our finished strip. I'm actually going to put on my other camera because it looks a little better. So, there's our finished strip. Um, again, we're going to pretend that I'd sewn my edges onto it. And, um, but that is seminal piecework. And it's just, it's such a pretty way to just add a little extra visual interest. And again, just to remind you that it can even be something that you add on later. <clears throat> so remember, like in the case of this jacket, if you look at the inside of this jacket, whoops, sorry, I have to me lighten this up a bit so you can see what's going on. So on the inside of this jacket, you can see the top stitching. Hopefully you can kind of see it. Let's see. That's about as exposed as I can get. But you can see there's the top stitching. So again, these are tubes. These are made into tubes that were top stitched onto the actual jacket. They're not pieced into the jacket. They're self-finished and applied to the jacket. So if you had something like this, So if you had something like this and you wanted to do that, you could simply fold under. So for instance, I have this half inch to work with. So you could fold under half an inch and you'd still have that quarter inch to work with. And you could top stitch that onto something. So even if you didn't piece it into your project, you can apply it to something. So that's, that's important to remember that you don't, you know, if you think, oh gosh, I've already, you know, sewn this, so I think I wanted to use it. Well, chances are you can go back and fix that. <laughs> okay, it's not the end of the world. It's all good. So if there's any questions, I'm gonna give you a moment to, to pop those up there, but um, otherwise that's seminal piecing. And as you can see, it's really very simple. It does take some planning, some, you know, some forethought, um, but it's not difficult. It just takes a little, a little bit of thoughtfulness. But it's really a great way to add a little extra oomph. Um, sometimes, again, you may have an accent fabric that would look really great to tie an outfit together, but you only have a little bit of it. Well, as long as you can strip some pieces in, <laughs> you're good to go. And so it's just, it's really a great, great way to, to make use of those scraps and to, to make your sewing extra special. And that's, that's what I really want for all of you is, you know, you can use the simplest patterns in the world. You know, you get a pattern that you like, that's basic, that fits you, fantastic. Use some of these techniques to take that one simple pattern and get a lot of looks out of it. And that just makes the best use of your time and materials. Okay, so I'm just again, just waiting to see if you have any questions. So far you haven't. So hopefully that means it all made sense, right? So um, again, I hope that you will try these techniques. And again, they're, they're, in, um, they're in my Craftsy class, Decorative Seams. So if you're a Craftsy subscriber, I encourage you to go check it out. If you're not a Craftsy subscriber, um, I know you already are know about National Sewing Circle, which is awesome, but check that out as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and just say happy sewing, have a great weekend, and I'll see you next month.